Welcome to Camilla Singh Show. Happy New Year's to all of you. I'm truly grateful for all of you giving us this encouragement to be here in 2024. You always called and always tell us how much you enjoy this political panel show because we are <laughs> asking the right questions and we are getting unfiltered right answer to you. So that is very great. But before we start the show, we would like to acknowledge the First Nations land we are on. We are on Kwatlen, Semiyamu, Moskium, and Katsi Nation. And we are truly grateful for the first people of this land to be able to allow us to live, laugh, grow, and have a voice. Thank you. With that, our panelists are back, and we're going to be putting them on the line and asking <laughs> some tough questions. So today what we want to do, we want to do year in review. What was 2023 mm -hmm. like? And how did we all survive that year? What made the headline? What were some of the issues that we dealt or how did we deal with or how we did not even deal with? Mm -hmm. First of all, I want to start with the war with the Palestinian and Israeli. Today, 7th of January, this three months gone by, today is that day. What have we learned? How were we able to help the people? Or are we staying silent just because nothing is happening? Our government is silent, everyone, we just put a zip, zipper. Maybe when I'm looking at the bigger picture, I'm also thinking, the reason that maybe this is why it's, uh, what is happening, not why is happening, is just because where are these people? What part of the world are we talking about? Are we talking about the privileged white kind or are we also talking about the poor people of color? Mm -hmm. That's why there is no resources have gone into them to help them or cease fire or anything like that. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to put them out to both of them mm -hmm. and start the year with that. We haven't done, but three months has gone by. Mm. So, Eileen, mm -hmm. <laughs> yes, <laughs> and Annie, mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and she just returned, I think, a few weeks ago, and she was a top ten oh, teachers yes. of the world, <laughs> in the world, yeah. and she was yeah. recognized as yeah. that. Not that long ago. Yeah. 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 Anyways, yeah. And Eileen is an activist, educator, and she's been one of our panelists, mm -hmm. and we continue 2024 with them. So welcome. Thank you, Camilla, and Happy New Year to you and to your listeners. And uh, very privileged to be uh, sitting here with you all. Mm. Yes. Um, when you talk about uh, the war in, uh, between Israel and Palestine, it is very sad what's going on. And uh, honestly, um, there's so much pressure on Israel to stop the war. But I think at this point and at this juncture that we are in, there, must, there, there should be as much pressure on Hamas to stop it also, because it's two ways, mm -hmm. right? We can't just hammer Israel to say, oh, you stop, stop, stop. But when the guns on the other side are coming also. So we have to see it with both eyes rather than just one. And the people who are caught in the middle, they're both Israelis, and the Palestinians. They are both suffering. And the people who are suffering most are the hostages. A number of the hostages have died. Um, yes. and, and that is so crucial. Um, I mean, I thought, you know, man, I believe that if it was our government, it would have, because we're a country of compassion, we would have done everything to not go too much into war as you must realize, um, we didn't go into Iraq to fight. Krechen, our prime minister at that time, Mr. Krechen, said, no, we're not going to uh, Iraq to fight. So I think we would have so solved the problem differently, but there has to be compassion for the hostages. 
and compassion for the people of Israel mm -hmm. uh, and the compassion for the people of Palestine. We have to look at it from all angles. We cannot narrow and, and put pathways into what's happening because collectively everybody's suffering. Yeah, I'll, I'll pick up on what Eileen said. I, I think that um, there has been some movement forward. We saw Canada finally vote for a ceasefire. Mm -hmm. um, I want to say that, as you pointed out, the idea that sometimes we don't look at conflicts because of people's skin color or what part of the, you know, the global majority, right, the global south. So you have things in Yemen and Sudan and Congo that are ongoing, right, that people are also struggling to raise their voice. I want people to not stop talking, whether it's releasing of hostages, whether it's peace, you know, where they are, um, the end to, to attacks, uh, you know, what we're hearing the word genocide, we're hearing the word apartheid, we're hearing a lot of different realities of what's going on, you know, in that part of the world. Um, I would say that very importantly, we, we must not let ourselves be divided into an mm. us versus them. So I, as a Sephardic Jew, can speak about Palestinians and their rights, and that is not anti-Semitic. Mm -hmm. That does not go against my own people. That does not go against my own faith, right? Palestinians can speak up for the rights of hostages, right? Like, like we can all speak up for human rights. Yeah. And that's what I don't want to see falter away. Mm -hmm. I was bored this morning when I saw that, the you know, if you go back prior to October 7th, and really for the last almost year or so, there were massive protests in Israel, mm -hmm. hundreds of thousands of people. We are seeing that come again. Just this morning, I saw some pictures out of, uh, out of Israel that show thousands of people starting to gather against this Netanyahu government. Mm -hmm. So I think our human rights, our democratic rights to speak up are incredibly important. So going into 2024 and wrapping up the year, you know, the, the action to stand up for innocent people, mm -hmm. no matter what flag they carry, mm -hmm. no matter their creed, no matter their faith, that we stand up for their human rights is very key. And I think we're going to see a lot of legal action coming forward. We saw South Africa taking on a legal case in the International Criminal Court. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot more to come. I, I do want to see an end to uh, the violence as it is, both you know, from, from Hamas side on all sides. And, and I do fear that this might grow into a bigger conflict. Uh, we see attacks in Lebanon. You know, we see these different things that are causing a lot of tension. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if they're going to lead us to peace. They're not going to lead to the safety of my family. They're not going to lead to the safety of Palestinian families, I think, unfortunately. So uh, I think we need to hold our governments accountable. So the journey continues in doing that. And that is to every single person. Palestinians holding Palestinians accountable, Israeli, Israeli you know, like, like eh, all of us, Canadians holding Canadian government accountable. Uh, so, you know, keep marching, keep speaking. Uh, keep bringing light to innocent people that are truly, truly suffering. Um, and, you know, I think in a way it's almost like we're all be being held hostage uh, under this, this, this war, whatever you want to call it, uh, this violence that, that really is not attributing to, to a peaceful situation. Okay, thank you. And I think I also strongly believe that we need to keep talking. Maybe three of us, all of you, let's keep talking. While you're sitting with three, five people, let's talk about it. We are not taking any sides. We can do very much. But keep this topic alive. At least Definitely. somebody is listening. Mm -hmm. So second thing I was going to talk about, the summer wildfires, mm. the climate change. Mm -hmm. And uh, what we are seeing right now, we are in the middle of winter now, but <laughs> I didn't even wear my winter jacket or whatever. Yeah. But they say next week uh, the, ch the weather will change. Mm -hmm. But I think we also have to say that it doesn't matter how much we talk about climate change, are we doing enough to make any difference? Or February, March going to come and we're still going to have that kind of fire because last two years, that's what has happened during summer months. That's all I remember. Where did the summer go? We just was not Combat able to bring fire. Yeah. 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 forest fire. Mm -hmm. So what brings uh, what I know we don't want to think now winter is here, we're not smelling that smoke, but we so, can't forget about it. I think I always think to, you know, this summer hearing the firefighters that were losing their homes. Yeah. As they were battling that very same fire. I think of the families that are displaced. I think of, 
you know, the disaster, you know, the business, you know, economic realities, right? When we talk about climate justice, mm -hmm. I think about how does it impact people? Mm -hmm. And it's not enough to ask firefighters and other folks, right, to, to combat, to be on the front lines, to evacuate in the Northwest Territories, right? The yeah. entirety of Yellowknife had to leave. How, uh, how unfair is that? So I, I think as, as governments, as people, to think, yeah, what can we do that's better? I'm seeing amazing things happening in the Netherlands and other places where they're starting to replace like massive chunks, quarters of their entire energy output to solar, to wind, to, to whatever, other, other cleaner energies. And, and I think we owe that yes. to the families that still are struggling to rebuild. We owe that to, to communities that have been, you know, completely, you know, a little wet, completely gone. And they're still trying to rebuild. We, we have to hold ourselves accountable to those people, in, in my mind, right? Um, you know, yes, it's nice to have a very mild winter. But do we realize that that means we're going to have worse fires this year? Yeah. We're not going to have enough water maybe in the summer? Mm -hmm. Like, these things aren't just minute moments. This is a cycle. It's something that just continues and continues. So... Uh, you know, I want to see governments that really speak to the humanity of people mm -hmm. as they struggle to survive these fires. And why should we just survive the fires? Why can't we get to a point where we're actually trying to, you know, make sure that there is a sense that the climate isn't... I mean, I don't know. I think we're almost too far. Mm -hmm. That's horrible to say. But I think we might be stuck in this cycle for a while, well outside of our lifespans. Mm -hmm. But we need to do something now. Um, I think BC is doing better in that. Mm -hmm. uh, I know in Alberta, Saskatchewan, and other places, they're really struggling with the idea of like green uh, transformations. But but I think we need to keep going uh, in that way. But I, I still, oh gosh, I remember the fire chief crying yeah. as he was talking about, you know, how many of his men and, and people uh, had, had lost their own homes. While they're saving somebody else's. While they're else's. saving somebody else's. Yeah. And that to me, and you know, and I think about climate refugees, yeah. islands that are sinking, the Maldives, Seychelles, etc., what about those people? And it's not enough to go, oh, we had a mild winter. Yeah. What does that actually mean mm -hmm. to, to, the, to the rest of the world and to the people that, uh, we know there's still zombie fires ongoing. So the fire season hasn't ended, mm -hmm. which is crazy to think about. So I, I'm looking into 2024 going, are we, are we going to set ourselves up for yet another record-breaking year? Yeah. yeah. Well, I, for me, um, I'm a realistic person. So I always have to think like, our world, you have to look at our earth collectively mm -hmm. and we have to compare the world to us, like mm -hmm. each of us, are, every day we get older. Mm -hmm. How old is our world, <laughs> right? How old is the earth? Mm -hmm. So with ev all the technologies and all the industries that have taken place in this world for humanity to survive, Look at us, wealthy people, people who have shoes, clothes on our back. It comes at, at a cost for, yeah. human, for, the, for the environment, right? Yeah. Yeah. And the earth, if you look at it, um, it was so good. I, 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 I wish I had written down where I, where I read this. But it says, the earth ages like we age. Mm. Mm. But, what about, but the earth has a, a, a provision within it that it has um, um, elements that can readjust itself mm -hmm. to accommodate the, the exposure it is at, mm -hmm. okay? So we have to, how the earth and the environment is reflecting in our present society, it's, it's trying to survive. Mm -hmm. It's trying to uh, shift itself and accommodate itself to the pressures that we are putting it to, mm -hmm. okay? And each little person, each one of us, like I don't have an electric car. I can't afford one at the moment. Mm -hmm. And But in my little world, I don't wash with hot and cold water. I wash mm -hmm. with cold, cold water, water. Yeah, yeah. you know? And I, uh, I have eliminated using my dishwasher mm -hmm. and because, hey, the thing goes hums and buns uh, two hours, yeah. like, mm, mm, you know? Yeah. So I'm, I'm not using that. And so all little things that we are doing in the world is helping the earth to rejuvenate itself. Mm -hmm. But we have to give it time, but not taking the focus away. 
there has to be give and take with the technologies and the industries that is within the earth that we cannot, like you and I can't help because pollution is getting into, we have to let the earth absorb the pollution and become what it has to become. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, so mm -hmm. let's moving on. I totally get that. And uh, so let's talk about the health care in British Columbia. It doesn't matter. Every 40 cents of a dollar that we pay in taxes to the government should be going to the health care, just for the health care. Are we doing that? Every time you hear that there is crisis, they don't have enough nurses, or doctors on call and they are closing down the ER. I understand there are more people moving to British Columbia, I understand that. As our population is also aging, I understand that as well. But when every 40 cents of a dollar and 60 cents go for everything else, I think that if we use that money, we should be able to have a better health care. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't seem like. And you know, there is a monopoly within the healthcare. We have so many people who have immigrated to this country with experience, and but they, their experience is regarded as third world because then they have to go to put themselves into school and get Canadian degrees, Canadian uh, certification. And I think they're trying to cut that into half now. Yeah. But I have to believe that if you're from England, you're from uh, Australia, you're from New Zealand, um, from Germany, from France, and you've been working in the ER over there, you got to be doing something good in your country before you immigrated to our country. Why can't we take all those good people, put them at least on tests, and I mean, make them an associate doctor yes. or an associate nurse, yeah. right? I mean, rather than say, oh, you're not, you're not good qualified. enough for yeah. us. Yeah. You're not good enough for us, for our Canadian uh, patients. Mm -hmm. And we're a whole bunch of healthcare people we are eliminating that can be feeling those positions that are empty at the moment. And I know the government is trying its best. It's trying its best. But we have to get through what? The unions. We have to get through the, to the unions of the doctors, of the nurses, to say, hey, you know, we need to break these barriers. But I don't know when the barrier will be broken. Till then, this is what we are going to get, in my opinion. I, I think the unions might have the answer. I don't, I don't work for the, any nurses or doctors' union, so I can't speak specifically to what they're, they're working on. Um, but, but I do agree. So we recently saw some changes, which is a long time coming. Yes. I mean, I remember my own dad. You know, many of us were immigrant families. How many times they were rejected from getting jobs, right? Yeah. Having to work you know, as a taxi driver, as a security guard, as whatever, mm -hmm. just to make ends meet. Meanwhile, they have qualifications from other countries. And I'm talking about, like, Morocco and, you know, the Middle East here. Um, I see the caretaker. I take care of my my dad, help my mom and myself, and and you know who are Filipino, amazing individuals yeah. who you know a lot of them are close to getting like a nursing degree, or maybe are already nurses back where they came from, who would work in American hospitals or you know like it's interesting to think like oh. when you look at their experience, like wait a minute, like like this is very much the same healthcare system. It's not mm -hmm. that different. Okay. Uh, we are in crisis mode. I think it's time to admit that. I, I think political cycles are such that oh, if you admit that, you lose the election, right? Mm -hmm. But we are losing people. People are dying. People are not getting the services they need. We have people going down to, um, sorry, Bellingham. I was going to say Bethlehem, Bellingham, thank you, Bellingham, to get cancer treatments. Yeah. Um, I think it's time to really put an honest reflection on what can we do now. It will be expensive, yeah. and maybe we have to deal with that. Because it's expensive now, but when you have to run around trying to find a walk-in clinic that's open, yeah. that isn't already full up, um, you don't really care at that moment mm -hmm. because you're in pain, right? Or maybe so there's something long-lasting going on that you need ongoing treatment for. Um, I'm, I don't think we should be in a triage mode. Yeah. I think triage mode is just the worst-case scenario, and we have the worst-case scenario. I know it takes about five to seven years to, for this to work itself through. Mm -hmm. uh, I think more changes need to be made. Um, and, and just a real dedication to, you know, everyone should have access to healthcare. I do believe that is a human right here in Canada. We are very lucky 
Americans don't have that. And we see the results through their health care and their uh, lived, uh, living expectations, right? Uh, maternal birth rates, right? It's worse in America. We're, we're literally a couple kilometers away, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. And the difference is so much. So, you know, yes, I think it needs to be public. I think there needs to be innovation in the system. I think we need to bring on more people yeah. um, and spend the money. Yeah. We know. We know it's going to be expensive, right? And, and I think the federal government also needs to realize at this point, uh, the healthcare system is falling apart in so many different provinces yeah. that now is the time. It's almost like a, you know, World War II, you know? Build it and they will come. And, you know, also we have to remember universal health care, there were strikes over it. Yeah. Not everybody wanted universal health care. And yet, literally the moment after it was finally done by Tommy Douglas, like, look at where we are now. That's like our number one thing that we all agree for uh, as Canadians that yeah. we are most proud of. Yeah. So there will be pain yeah. to say we need to provide people with jobs. We need to build more of this. We need to spend money here. Do it. Yeah. Do it and, and explain to us why this is important. And in the long run, we're going to be healthier. Um, but I think we're just letting people, we're falling through the cracks. Yep. And I mean like us, yep. right? Not even people that are, you know, like I, I see it in my own family mm -hmm. where we are struggling to get just one doctor to mm -hmm. see my dad, to see my mom, to see me. Like, how is this possible? Mm -hmm. um, and it's very sad because then it makes people question the public health care system. It's going to happen the same thing with housing crisis that we are <laughs> facing right yeah. to now. Yeah. You know, and that... The no houses was start building 10, 15 years ago. Now we all of a sudden we wake up one morning and just say, oh, we don't have a place to live. Yeah. Same thing with the health care now. Yeah. So I think it's a wake up call for everybody. Mm -hmm. My final question is about uh, illicit drugs, mm -hmm. <laughs> legalizing the drugs. And now they are saying that there's no drugs allowed in playgrounds, schools and all that. They are just those restricted ones. But Seven people die each month yeah. in British Columbia with this drug crisis we have. Mm -hmm. Have we made any headlines? Mm -hmm. Have we made any changes to anybody? People that are struggling, are detox centers or help that they need? Uh, or we are just more and more people, we're losing more and more people. And these are people between the age of 10 to 59 years old. Mm -hmm. To be your child, my child. Yeah. So many younger people are going because of the illicit drugs yeah. that's going around. Yeah. What are your thoughts on that? Mm, yeah, it's it's a, that is one of the most saddest situation that we have in British Columbia. It's not seven people in a month. It's seven people probably in two hours. Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. you if you look at the statistics of how many people have died in British Columbia alone yeah. with this illicit drugs, it is something that parents, brothers, sisters, mothers, fathers, all it's a community effort yeah. to gather these people into our arms and say, How can we help you? Yeah. You know, it's 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 something that we None of us can kind of pin our fingers at and say, okay, you have a drug problem, you, because nobody uh, literally comes and says, you know, Eileen, I go home mm -hmm. and, and, you know, yeah, I'm so home. overwhelmed and I take this. Mm -hmm. and it's, it's something that they do very discreetly mm -hmm. and it's uh, hidden. And, and we've had a lot of good people who died by, you know, buying drugs on the street or from a dealer and just for recreation purposes, right? But how do we get a handle of that? I'm telling you, I don't know what the situation is. The government is trying to do a few things, but I literally agree that, you know, playground is meant for children, it's meant for families, and there has to be places where people can go and use drugs safely, like, just like they have a smoke home. I see, I see all those smoke <laughs> shops around, right? I, I never saw them before. But lately, I think between from last year to this year, I've seen a couple of them rise up. But I don't know how, honestly, I, my, I lose sleep over it. I lose, how do we restructure this? It's something that slippering from everybody's hands. Yeah, this is part of my academic background, so I can, I can speak to this. Um, 
So yeah, I, I think with the with the project that was launched to to decriminalize a specific amount of drugs, specific amount, I think people need to look at the long term perspective. When they did this in Europe, it, it was it got into trouble, right? There were some difficulties, and then over time, over many decades, it, it smoothed it out. So I, I don't want to be too harsh of, of, of criticism on it because it'll never work overnight. Because addiction is not solved overnight. I think what has happened is drug toxicity, toxicity, which is what we have right now, because people are dying from toxic drugs. Yeah. Okay. So what happens? You know, you brought up the idea of like you know racism in our immigration system for a long time let's be blunt nobody cared yeah. because as long as it wasn't your child you know as long as it was the junkie on the street right mm. those people the downtown east side wally whatever nobody cared and then when fentanyl and car fentanyl and all these other things started to really spike up all of a sudden when you have most people who are dying are people that are men between the ages of 18 and 40 who work in trades they have jobs they live at home you know like, yeah. like this is not family, your yeah. you know your your stigmatized you know dehumanized whatever homeless person yeah. mm -hmm. so all of a sudden now people care and the answer is the same Absolutely, we need mental health facilities. We need more detox, more uh, safe injection sites, which by the way, people don't realize are rarely standalone sites. Mm -hmm. So the first one ever in North America had detox from day one mm -hmm. attached to it, mm -hmm. right? It took them 11 years to fight off the government mm -hmm. to be allowed to, to keep going. So no, the, you know, we're not trying to say drugs are okay, everybody take yeah. drugs, have a good time. That's not the, um, what we're trying to do like, in terms of decriminalizing a certain amount of drugs. However, same thing goes. If you really care about your economy, if you really care about your taxes, if you really care about your health care, mm -hmm. then you need to really up the bets because addiction takes time. Yeah. I, I, I always say for people who smoke mm -hmm. or drink alcohol, mm -hmm. and I think this is where I want to end. So we see in Vancouver how they're making it easier to drink alcohol. Yeah. But we know from police statistics, all kinds of statistics, domestic abuse, sexual violence, etc., that alcohol is the drug, is yeah. the substance that causes the most pain in our society, mm -hmm. whether it's physical, mental, emotional, etc. So family. don't tell me you're against drugs, but then make it easier to acquire alcohol. Yes. Right? And this, you know, addiction is a pain. Addiction is, an, is, a, is, is a, a wound uh -huh. that a person has, and there needs to be long-term access to facilities so that people do not choose to use. Yeah. But to just say that decriminalization doesn't work, Let's give it time. Let's make changes. If people are using in playgrounds, whatever, yeah, that's completely inappropriate, right? A absolutely, right? But please don't be hypocritical about, well, I can drink all day and yeah. I can do this and yeah. I can do that. And I'm, but it's those like, people, it's not those it's people. Listen, like you said, us, yeah. it, like you said, it's our community. Yeah. It's our families. With that, <laughs> <Sorry. laughs> with that. <laughs> thank you so much for both of you for coming. And I'm looking at the clock. Yeah. We went over time, but <laughs> thank you and keep. Tune in to Camilla Singh Show and we'll continue this. Thank you. Thank you.